Amen, amen, amen. All right, I got some things up here to adjust. We're going to get to some of that stuff later. But first off, we're going to go to John chapter 15. If you've got your Bibles or if you're taking notes, John chapter 15. And if you're not taking notes, why not? take notes. Um, It just helps you remember. Um, So we're going to John chapter 15. Jesus says, I'm the true grapevine. Um, And the context here, um, we talked about this a little bit last week. So if you know anything about the gospels and the story of Jesus, they had the last supper. There's been a painting made of that. They had the last supper and Jesus gave his disciples the new covenant. He gave them the bread and he gave them the wine and said, this is my body. This is my blood. And now we're going to have a new relationship and I'm going to the cross for you. And the disciples started to get sad at the idea that he was going to leave them. And he has this moment where he washes their feet. If you might remember that. And after all of that's done, he says, now I'm going for sure. I'm leaving. And they get all sad about that. And then they take this walk and they're going to a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus is going to pray there. And he's going to have that massive prayer time between him and God where he makes the final decision. Yes, I am for sure going to the cross. So he's hours away from getting arrested. This is the final journey, and and on that walk that they take to Gethsemane, um, this is one of the teachings that Jesus Christ gives to his remaining 11 disciples. And I know I said 12 before, but one of them left, if you remember. Judas had betrayed Jesus, and at this point, he's already left to start the process of having Jesus arrested. And then Jesus comes in, verse 1, and says, I am the true grapevine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do, not, that do bear fruit. So they will produce even more. Um, I am the true grapevine. Uh, one of the things I want to tell you is that word true there, it's actually in the text. There's a different Greek word there that means I'm not the counterfeit vine. I'm the real vine. Now, why does Jesus stop to say, just so you know, I'm the real vine, The reason is, is because all throughout the Old Testament, there were many different passages that talked about the nation of Israel as the vineyard of God. And there was this idea that that was the place that had God's blessing. That was the place that other vines would come and get attached and be under God's program if they only came and were part of Israel or Judaism. And there are many prophecies where God came and spoke about that vineyard that he loved and said, the problem is now they've gone after idolatry. Now there is oppression in my vineyard. Now there is violence in my vineyard. The grapes, he even says in the book of Isaiah, that I expected there to be good grapes out of my vineyard. They've only been bitter fruit out of my vineyard. And then Jesus comes along in Luke chapter 20. And you can study all this for yourself because you're taking notes. Uh, Jesus said in Luke 20, that he said there's been problems in the vineyard and the vineyard workers are stealing the grapes and they're even going to kill the son of the owner. And that was a prophecy about himself. And so God's made a decision to take the vineyard away from this group of people and he's going to give it to someone else. And that someone else is himself. So when Jesus comes here to the disciples privately just to these 11 and says, I'm the true vine, What he's saying is, this is a whole new system. This is a whole new gospel. This is a whole new way to God. And it's no longer through the nation of Israel anymore. It's through Jesus Christ alone. That's how you're going to have your salvation is through him. He is the true grapevine, which means, think about grapevine for a second. He's the source of life. It's, It's how the rest of the grapes stand up. It's their foundation. And not only is it their physical foundation, but you're not going to get any sap unless you're connected to the vine. Amen? Amen. And so all your, all your water, all your nutrients are going to, it's all going to come through him. And he's given us a picture of the Christian life there. Also, this is similar to the sheepfold illustration that we had like three or four weeks ago, if you were here for it. Jesus picked one kind of picture from this agricultural environment that everybody around him would have known what the sheepfold meant. And then he just used the picture and started attaching different players to the different roles in the sheepfold. He does the same thing today. He's going to give us a grape vine and a vineyard, and he's going to attach the different people to the different roles. So I'm going to have to explain to you non-grapevine people what this all means. And it's okay. We're going to do all of that. 
Verse three, you've already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you, he says. Remain in me and I will remain in you for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and you cannot produce fruit or be fruitful unless you remain in me. You got to stay connected. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. Say nothing. Nothing. That's how much you can do apart from Jesus. Nothing. Big verse right there. Um, that's one of those verses that just ought to keep coming up in your heart, in, in your Christian walk, is apart from Jesus, I can do nothing. Even though I think I can, even though I think I can drum up some activities, I can be involved, I can do a whole lot of things, but I can't do anything that really matters, real fruit, unless I'm connected to Jesus. Now, the, this first statement here, you've already been pruned and purified. Uh, now, there's a Greek word in there that means kind of both. It means to be cleaned and it means to be pruned. And the idea here is that sometimes you've got to clean something up. But sometimes you go to a branch as a gardener and you take one branch with all the different shoots off of it and you're going to remove the diseased shoots or you're going to remove the weak shoots so that the best sap goes to the best shoots along that branch, if that makes any sense. And that process, it's called cleaning in that world. And so he uses the same word for both here. And he begins with this statement of grace to his disciples. He's like, listen, pruning's going to come, but you're already pruned, past tense. You're already clean. And what in the world does he mean by that? He means they're saved. He means they have grace. It means that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Behold, the old is gone and the new has come past tense. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation at all, even though there's work to do in your soul and in your life. Yes, there's work to be done, but you're not condemned. You're saved past tense. You've got grace. You've got a foundation. And the people that he's saying this to right now, he's talking to 11 men and they're a mess, by the way, because he's already lost one disciple who's off to betray him. And the 11 that remain, he's looking at them. One of them's about to deny that they even know him three times in a matter of hours. And out of the remaining 10, I'm trying to do math here, nine of them will completely abandon Jesus before the cross. Out of fear, they'll go running for their lives and they're going to scatter. There's only one disciple out of 12 that's going to make it all the way to the cross, stay by his side. His name is John, who wrote this gospel. And John will be right there and Jesus will look down from the cross and say, Mary, behold your son. And John, behold your new mother because he takes care of his mom at the cross. But John's got to be there for that to happen. So statistically speaking, you could say a lot of things about Jesus' st uh, success rate with disciples. Some of you parents have felt condemnation before by your kids' behavior that you raised in the church. Maybe focus a little bit in on Jesus' own success rate. Might make you feel a little bit more balanced on that, yeah? So he's saying you're already clean, even though they're about to abandon him. You're already clean. What a statement of grace. You're about to abandon me, but I say you have grace and that you're saved. It's a massive thing for him to say. Remain. Now, then he starts talking about remain. You, you'll notice I, that I highlighted those in a particular color. It's not because I'm having fun with fonts, even though that was part of it. Um, why? Because Jesus says the word remain over and over and over again through this passage. He's going to say it so many times, remain, 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 that you're almost going to be sick of it. It's the one action verb that he's going to give to us and say, you've just got to keep doing this. And so this whole message is trying to figure out what in the world does remain mean? So I'll start with the Greek. The Greek means to remain. It, re it means to stay, to stay put, to dwell, to abide, some of your translations say. Um, there's a verse where it says that Jesus went and stayed in a certain house that day. And that's that remain word. He remained in this house that day. And then his disciples decided to go with him. And so they also stayed or remained in that house. It's just a simple, basic word. It means you just kind of lived in that place. You stayed put. You didn't leave. 
That's the word that he keeps using. So maybe by the end of the message, count how many times. First service didn't do it. Count how many times remain shows up. Let me know. Remain. It's an odd choice. It feels passive. Doesn't it feel passive? Jesus, I want a more active word, please. I want something that feels like I can do this, but remain just feels like, like, why didn't you tell me to give a lot of money? Why didn't you tell me, Jesus, to read my Bible every single day for an hour at least? Jesus, why wasn't your main command so that I could be in the vine? Why wasn't it something that I could be, just really, really measure well and feel like I accomplished? Maybe covertly tell my Christian buddies about it so they'd pat me on the back about it. That's just me. That's, that one is just me. Jesus says, stay put. Live in Jesus and don't leave. Don't grow legs, branch, and leave the vine. Stay put. Next, he talks about fruit. He says, if you stay put in the vine, you'll grow grapes. And that's good news. Um, apart from me, you can do nothing. Um, and then he says, you can't make fruit on your own. So what's, what's fruit? So we figured out remain. We figured out the vine. What's the fruit? Fruit is character in scripture. Here's a verse, Galatians 5.22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience. Are you more patient today than you were a year ago? Amen. <laughs> Are you more kind? Yes. How about when it matters? Any of these that you're struggling with? Yep. He's saying if the Holy Spirit's coming more and more into your life, more and more fruits being developed, what you're going to start to see is you're going to start to see an increase. You're going to start to see a change. That's the idea of fruit, gentleness, self-control. There is no law against these things. Jesus wants these things growing in your life. Again, Jesus, why didn't you say fruit is converts in church planting? Um, you got John and you got Peter right there. Like, why not just tell those guys, go plant some churches and convert a whole bunch of people. And if you were here with us when we did the book of Acts, they do a lot of that. But here's the thing, making new converts and new disciples is a lot like cloning yourself spiritually. What's the point of cloning people of low character and making more people of low character? Jesus comes in here in his way and he says, character's king. Character is the main thing. If you're doing this thing right, it's your character that's increasing and a lot of times, the only people that can see that new fruit of character in your life are those that are closest to you. When the doors are closed, at home, where it matters, can I get an amen? Because that's where it matters. And that's where it's toughest. It's so different from the world, right? Like, like the world comes in and says, we want a superstar who looks really good and has got a lot of charisma and we're going to give them a lot of influence. Jesus is going the other direction. Says it's not about influence and charisma. It's about character. And this might start really, really small. And I might grow you really, really slow. But I'm going to grow you in the right way. And we're going to replicate the right thing. Whew. Um, we have a grapevine at home. Um, got a slide picture for that. There it is. Um, you can see some branches and you can see a vine there. We planted this two or three years ago. I don't remember exactly when. You could call it the true vine if you wanted. Oh, gosh. It was terrible first service too. Uh, <laughs> um, but I had to do it. Anyway, uh, branches and there's a vine at the bottom there. And um, just trying to get ready for this message, I went to a couple people, uh, did some looking around online, trying to figure out how to take care of a grapevine really, really well, what all the techniques are. And by the time I got to the end, I became convinced that we're killing our vine at home, basically. We don't know what we're doing at all. Um, we're doing all the wrong things. And, and there are branches on there that are kind of diseased. I started to look and was horrified at what I saw. So don't kill your grapevines at home. Um, Jesus called God the Father, the, or the uh, gardener or the vine dresser, and said, he's coming in, he's inspecting the vine, and he's inspecting your branch, and he's taking care of it himself. Um, 
Got a branch right here. Yesterday, uh, Gracie, it's Gracie's vine, technically. She allowed me to cut off a branch that we had determined was not that great of a branch anyway. And I cut it off too early because it's already getting flat um, and not looking very good at all. This, this was going to be a cluster of grapes right here. Guess what? It'll never be a cluster of grapes. And these will never come back. And this will never grow anything. Why? Because it's not connected anymore. And sometimes in the Christian life, we're like, I need more patience with my kids. And we white knuckle it. Uh, more patience. Uh, more, less anger, right? I really need to try harder. And you listen to sermons. And I really need to try more of this. And everything is about effort with a disconnected vine. Jesus is saying, be connected, don't try harder. Right? Like, that's what he's saying. It's all about remaining. It's all about staying put where you're supposed to be in him. And then fruit starts to come. And God the Father starts to take care of you like a good gardener. And he keeps a good vine. He doesn't kill vines like I do. It's not about striving, white knuckling, or trying. It's about remaining in Jesus. Verse 6. Here comes a difficult truth. This is a tough one. It says, anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Kind of like this one. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. So Jesus is saying sometimes there's branches and they just will never, ever bear any fruit. And sometimes you've got branches in the vine. And these represent souls. These represent people. This, again, it's a tough moment. And he's saying, they're just not ever going to. And God has a way of removing them as the gardener. Ooh. Um, when, when I was uh, doing some research into these, these vines, they were talking about the fact that if you leave the dead um, branches in there, um, it's, it's not neutral because they tend to attract pests and disease. The dead ones do. And once they attract pests and disease, that pest and disease, once it gets rooted in there, it'll start to spread to the good branches. And so you have to clean those out. And there's time. And you got to do it in time. And so if I could just try to s figure out what God is trying to talk about here, I think sometimes in the church, Sometimes in the church, we've got folks that are coming in and they've got questions and they've got doubts and they're not sure where they stand with Jesus or they're attracted to the church. There's sometimes we, we have a relationship with the church, but we don't have a relationship with Jesus because a lot of things about the church attracted us. Like we're attracted by the healthy community. We are attracted by the music. We are attracted by the movement that was happening. We are attracted by a lot of different things, made us feel good. The problem is, is that you haven't chosen Jesus and the relationship with him hasn't started. And what I see this saying is at some point, God starts to push. And I've seen that happen. Sometimes we got folks that'll, they'll stick around just long enough until some really hard confrontational truth comes out of the scripture and then they're out. Because their loyalty wasn't to Jesus himself, it was to an experience. Yeah. And when your loyalty is to an experience and not to Jesus, then that stuff that you don't want to hear, well, then you do what a lot of people do. You just, you leave what you don't want to hear. Yeah, hard stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Sometimes too, there's, there's emphasis on us doing things together and having certain ministry moments together and and there's body life stuff, and, and, and all of a sudden that stuff isn't, um, it's not music to your ears, it's, it's uh, fingernails on a chalkboard to you. And you just start to move out, and I, I think that's what the fa he's talking about here, with the Father, Father just starts to remove you. Hard. 
Um, there's another parable, and I'll just say it briefly. We're not going to read it, but um, this is one of Jesus' parables, and he talks about another vineyard, and he talks about a vine that just will never produce fruit. And there's a conversation between one of the workers in the vineyard and the gardener, and, and they hey, why isn't this thing producing? And says, hey, he hasn't, this particular vine hasn't produced any fruit in years. I think we should just pull it out. And the gardener says, no, not yet. There's hope in that. No, not yet. He says, let's give it one more year, one more season. Let's dig around it. Let's replace some of the soil. Let's put some, some fertilizer and some nutrients. In. Like you can read it. These are all Jesus's words. He's like, let's do all of this to try to reboot it, shore it up, give it another chance. And then we'll come back next year and see if it made any difference. But if it made no difference, then remove it. And, and I, hear, I hear the hope and the care and the kindness and the patience of God in all of that, but also a warning that if our plan here is someday I may choose Jesus, there's a timetable. And that time is not unlimited. Be careful. This is eternal. Choose Jesus. That grace that we started with, that you are clean. That is a gift that he extends to you because he purchased it for you on the cross. Your sin's forgiven. And then the journey starts and then you get plugged in and he starts to grow you. But it is essential that you understand that you start with a major point of surrender. We talked about surrender last week. God, I would love for you to get saved. I would love for you to give your whole life, your whole eternity to him. It's okay to have your questions and doubts. You just can't have them forever. We offered to people last week, like if, if you're gonna give your heart to Jesus Christ, if you're gonna pray that prayer to him and surrender to him, we've got free Bibles in the back and you guys took all of our Bibles. Um, they, were, they were gone. I've only got six left. I'd love for you to pray and receive Christ today. Um, go get a Bible, ask him back at the sound booth. We got six of them left. And if we run out, we'll just order more and we'll have your Bible here for you next week. Get baptized today. Do the whole thing today, amen? amen. amen. Actually, let's pray. Can we pray? I know this is out of order. Let's just do it. Lord Jesus. And this is, if this is your moment, I'm gonna give you phrases to pray. We're all, gonna, we're all gonna say them together out loud. And you would just say these words to him. You would cross this massive line in eternity and God will help you do it. But say the words in your own words to him because he knows if they're real. But dear Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I believe that you rose from the dead. I believe that you died for me. Now my life is not my own. I give it to you. You have my future. You have my past. Fill me with your spirit. You are Lord now. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you cross that line <coughs> with the Lord, your entire eternity just changed. Um, get a Bible. Get baptized today. Let's keep moving. Um, Hmm. Branches with no fruit. The vineyard. So Jesus has already named all the players. So in the vineyard, you got the vine, and the vine is Jesus. You've got the gardener. The God, gardener is God the Father walking around with his, his pruning shears. Um, you've got the connected branches. That's, that's believers who are having increasing fruit in their lives. And then you've got the dead or disconnected branches with no fruit. And, and so much of this, whenever I hear this uh, taught on, uh, it's so focused on Jesus, and it should be, because this is one of his I am statements. He reveals God, right, by saying, I am the true vine. He's showing us who he is, our sustenance, our support, our, our everything. But he also pulls the Trinity in, the, in this in a, a really great way. He shows us that God the Father is super active. He's the one who's pruning. He's the one who's making sure these vines stay healthy, okay? 
And I love that. So the father is massively involved. And then if you keep reading this, I'm not going to take us all the way to the end of the chapter, but he's also going to talk about the coming Holy Spirit at the end of the chapter, because the whole Trinity itself is all working together on your growth. It's a massive thing. So let's talk about the father's pruning. These guys, <clears throat> I tried to make them as shiny and sharp looking as possible so I could get maximum fear out of you. <laughs> Pruning's a nice word. <sighs> Pruning's a nice word. It just means cutting things. And cutting implies pain. Right? <laughs> Dane's like, stop, would you? <laughs> mm. <laughs> so why do things need to be pruned? Because sometimes there is something in your life that is diseased. It just needs to be removed. So, sometimes it's a behavior. Sometimes it's a relationship. Sometimes it's a job. And, and, and God comes in and he strategically removes that thing with all of his kindness, all of his love. He's not just hacking away at things, right? Like he's very surgically, precisely removing the things in your life that are stopping you from producing fruit. And, and sometimes he's going to have to remove good things so that only the best things get the sap in the branch. Some of you guys know enough about gardening to know that that's a very real thing. You can have, you can have uh, uh, shoots that are going off into the shade and they're still green, but they're never going to have any fruit and they're not pulling in any sunlight. And so you're going to go and you're going to remove those good things so that all that nutritious sap is going to go to the best things. Because there's been friendships in my life that God pruned out of my life for such a reason. Jobs he pruned out of my life for such a reason. Things I used to believe about God from the tradition that I was raised in, the church I was raised in, and it just was holding me back. And so God brought a good brother or sister along who challenged me with certain scriptures so I could see that that was wrong and unhealthy for me. See, those moments are not supposed to crush you. Those moments are supposed to set you free. That's part of what he wants for you. Um, back when we all went through COVID-19, it was a major pruning episode in my life. Um, at that time, there was so many things, right? It's like so many things, it's, it's impossible to explain it all. But as a church, we started at one size church and after a while, we were about 50% of that size. That's reality. And God's grown us since then. Amen. Praise God for that. Amen. That was a season of pruning for me. I don't mean God pruned 50% of our people away from us. I'm not trying to say that at all. My goodness. And some of those folks found themselves in great churches after that. Like there's so many things that I could say about all of that. That pruned me. How? If you'd have come and asked me pre-COVID uh, what success was, I would have said introducing people to Jesus, helping people find Jesus, helping people grow in Jesus. I would never in my speech, my pastor's speech, have told you having a big church was part of it. But all of a sudden, when you took 50% of that church away, I was feeling pain. Why was I feeling pain? Because that invalid identity thing about what success is had crept into my heart and I didn't even know it was there. And so we all had a different COVID experience, but that was mine is God set me straight again on who I am and what I'm really supposed to be all about. We'd make plans as a church and none of the plans would work because everything was changing every single week any strength and peace that we got from routine all went out the window. All the wisdom that we had and all the, all the leadership principles that we understood as a staff, they all went out the window because none of them worked there. And all of a sudden we found ourselves helpless and at a new level of dependence on him. Now, I can say that in hindsight. It's not how it felt right then. It felt a whole lot of awful. 
but that's how the pruning goes, right? And I look back on it now and God pruned us so that we could be better in character. Praise God for that. Yes. Praise God for that. Uh, some of you guys have been through trials or you're going through trials right now. And God's been doing some pruning and you have mistaken it for judgment for some sin that was in your life. And I'm not saying you're a perfect person, but don't interpret every moment of pain or God working in you as this is judgment for a thing I did wrong. This is a good gardener who loves you coming in and saying, I want you to be better. That's the goodness of God. He has better for you and he is kind. Verse nine, I have loved you even as the father has loved me. So remain in my love. That's a big statement. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, Jesus said, just as I obey my father's commandments and I remain in his love. This, so it's an interesting thing. He, so he says, remain in my love. So we're not just remaining anymore. We're remaining in his love more specifically. He's kind of defining it for us right now. If you remain in his love, step one, then you'll obey his commandments. And if you obey his commandments, then you remain in his love. <laughs> What he's doing there is he's setting up a circle because this is how it's going to work in your spiritual life. Which is it? It's both. If I remain in a place of being in love with Jesus, I'm going to be more inclined to obey his commands. If I obey his commands, not out of pressure or fear or trying to impress people, but because of love for him, I'm going to find myself loving him more and better. And one of those feels kind of passive and one of those feels kind of active. And he gives you both in a circle and he gives you the first step of remain in his love. So which is it, Jesus? Is it passive grace? We always run into this in the scripture. We always run into this as a church. And some of you guys have been very confused by this. Like, which is it? Is it, is it that it's all by grace alone and I only like accept his gift and receive from him and I'm just supposed to sit here and be saved and be loved? Or is it that I'm supposed to work really hard at the Christian life and I'm supposed to obey all of the things? Which is it? Yes. See all the above. It's both. C.S. Lewis said it's like two blades on the scissors. If you want the effect to happen, they both have to slice, right? You have to have your effort and you have to have God's grace and they have to go together. It's not one or the other. It's both and in combination the way he wants it to be. Amen. Why? Because if you think it's all about your effort in obeying all the, uh, all the commands that Jesus has given to you and doing it perfectly, and reading your Bible perfectly every day and going to church every single Sunday and giving the way that you're supposed to give and doing all of the things, you will eventually be crushed by your imperfection because you will get to a spot where you'll realize you can't measure up. Amen. And that place of, of, of surrender, of, of helplessness, that's part of where God wants you to be, Amen. right? Because all of a sudden you start to feel really small in a moment like that and he gets really big in a moment like that. Because you need him. It is humble. But also if you flip to the other side and say, it's only ever about grace. What do you do with 70% of the New Testament where Jesus is saying, I need you to do this. Because he's always doing this. I need you to do this in your parenting. I need you to do this in your marriage. I need you to do this at your work, with your sex life, with your money, with your retirement, with everything. He's got an opinion about everything. What do you do with all of that if it's just grace. No, it's both. You've got to do both, but you've got to do it with the right motive. Um, I've seen this in Linda and I's marriage. Um, <clears throat> in Linda and I's marriage, um, there are things that Linda wants me to do. There are commands she wants me to obey. Does that wake you up? <laughs> Right, you're like, well, that's inappropriate. <laughs> Here's the thing. I know we don't call them commands and I know we don't say obey because we're way nicer than that as people, right? And, and we got a, a relationship of mutual respect and equality and all of that, absolutely. And so what we do is when we go to tell somebody that they need to obey us in this, we soften it, don't we? 
But all the softness is still like, I still need you to pick up your towel off the floor. And I still need you to pay this bill. And I still need you to keep track of this appointment. And I still need you to do all of these things. And for Linda, it's things like, I need you to ask me about my day and actually truly want to know about it and put your phone down and be active listening. And she needs that from me. And she needs me to obey that, yes? yes? Call it whatever you want, but that's what it is. She needs me to do the things for her. She wants me to water the plants on the outside porch. There's a lot of things that she wants me to do. When we sit down on the couch at night, she wants me to hold her hand. There's things that she has articulated to me she would like me to do, and I've articulated some things that I would like her to do. But here's what I've noticed. There are times when I feel really in love with Linda, and I do all of the things. And when I don't feel in love at all, <laughs> I don't do all of the things. Because <laughs> that's kind of how it works, right? And sometimes, man, we're just in a place and everything is just perfect and it's just going and we're just in love and it's awesome and, and we're doing all of the things and it's, it's fantastic. But then sometimes there's bitterness and sometimes there's pain and unforgiveness. And when the unforgiveness comes in and the anger comes in and the impatience comes in, we start to feel really distant with each other. And sometimes when you're in those moments, it feels impossible to resurrect the thing, doesn't it? Guess what? Start doing the things again. But start doing the things not to earn or not out of fear because the motives matter. Start doing the things so that we'll be in love more. And as we're in love, it's going to be easier to do the things. Do you see this loop that Jesus is setting up? Because it's the same thing with God. When you're in love with Jesus, you do all of the things that Jesus wants. You obey my commands. But when you're out of it and you're disconnected from the vine... You don't find yourself doing anything, or if you do anything, it's out of fear. It's out of a desire to impress your other brothers and sisters in church, right? But our motives matter. So I got to do the things that keep me remaining, staying put in the love of Jesus Christ. And as I do, as I find myself more and more stirred up in my affection and love for him, I'm over here and I'm obeying. But when I'm obeying, I need to obey for the motive of falling more deeply in love with Jesus Christ. Amen. Like, man, that sounds really emotional. It is really emotional. It's okay. But it matters. So what do you need for a good marriage? Do you need to just be in love or do you need to do all of the things for each other? Yes. All of the above. Jesus said, remain in my love. Matt Chandler said it like this. He said, find the things that stir your affections for Christ and saturate your life in those things. Find the things that rob you of that affection for Christ and walk away from those things. That's the Christian life as easy as I can explain it to you. It's just a change of your schedule. It's a change of the types of activities that you do on a regular basis. There are certain things that just suck the love of Jesus right out of you, right? Like some of us are absolutely hooked up and plugged into the Netflix vine or the ESPN vine or the Mark Zuckerberg vine or the MSNBC vine, name a vine. We're plugged into that thing instead of to Jesus. And I'm not saying those things are bad. We got Netflix. I love Netflix. Netflix is great. But man, there's some shows we can just spend too much time on. And I come away and I feel distant from Jesus. I'm not more in love with him. Less. I feel, I feel like I've taken poison in. It's like, well, that's an Academy Award winning thing. It's just so real and authentic. I know. Won all kinds of awards. It's like a super realistic 3D picture of a cesspool. It just is. Yes. And you're taking that in and it's sticking in your thoughts and you're trying to process it at night. And you wonder why you're losing your temper with your wife. Well, because you've been feasting on the wrong things. 
And some of you with the sports, and I don't know much about sports, but some of you with the sports, it's like the wrong guy took the wrong ball into the wrong place and you're upset for days. I'm just saying, what's it doing to you, you know? I mean, be passionate, but what's it doing to your relationship with Jesus for real? Just start to take inventory of all of the stuff. The 24 seven news is the exact same way. It's like, do you come away more more fearful? Do you come away more high strung and unable to have peace? Well, maybe look at that then. Your life is different than my life. Your walk is different from my walk. Just simply increase the things that make you more in love with Jesus. Does coming to church make you more in love with Jesus? Then come to church. Go into a Bible study. Do you remember the days when you used to be at a Bible study in a life group and you were so close to Jesus and you missed those days? Guess what? Time to get into a life group again. Amen. Right? I mean, it's just, it's just that kind of simple stuff. There's so many different ways that you can do it. Go and read a, a Christian autobiography of a great missionary and the way that they walked with God and feel the heat off of their faith and their life and let that influence you. Find yourself coming away more in love with Jesus Christ. Take a Sabbath. Some of you guys take Sabbath wrong. Take a better Sabbath. Take a deluxe Sabbath. Take a deluxe Sabbath where you go out into nature, just you, and you leave your phone behind and you'll get lost and die, I know. (laughs) Trust, Trust Jesus to get you back. But you need a distraction-free environment. Gift that to yourself. To just go and spend a few hours with God and don't have an agenda. And don't give yourself like, if I leave here and I haven't done X, Y, and Z, I'm a bad Christian. It's like, get rid of all of that. Just waste some time with God in silence. Maybe he'll speak. Maybe he won't speak. Maybe you'll just feel him present and near, but it'll change you things like that. But start looking at those like, this is the buffet opportunity. Like you go to commute, don't turn on the thing that you always turn on. Your next commute, just let silence be there. The first half mile, just say, Jesus, would you speak something fresh to me, something new to me? And just let silence be there. God, give that to yourself. Just spend time in things that stir your affections for Jesus, amen? amen. Be in the room, just stay. Why don't you guys stand? Let's pray. And then baptisms. Ooh. Jesus, I pray, God, that you would, even now, God, as this room switches over to uh, water baptism time, God, and the joy comes in, Lord, I pray that you would just give us a space, just give us a quiet moment here where you'd speak to us. And God, I ask, Lord, that you would maybe just bring to us to our minds right now just some things that we need to start doing to stir our affection for Jesus. Some things we need to add, spend more time in. Just show us, show us those things, God. Keeps us remaining in you. And then, Lord, would you start to show us some things that maybe we've talked ourselves into, that they don't cross lines and It's okay for a Christian to have this in their life. We talked ourselves into all that, but the truth is, it's just pulling us away from you, God. Would you show us what those things are? Lord, grow fruit in us. Prune what needs to be pruned. We love you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.